Terrific. Thank you so much for reading the Bible so clearly for us. I would love you to keep your Bibles open at Mark chapter 7. Let me add my welcome to everybody else. My name's Lee. I'm the senior pastor of the church. It's a delight to see you if you are particularly here for the first time, uh, whether you are here in Scarborough to stay for a while, maybe you're looking for a church. It's delightful that you have joined us this morning. I hope it's been an encouragement so far. Or if you're on holiday passing through, again, we, we trust the Lord has brought you through um, these doors for a particular reason this morning. And as his word is opened, let's be praying that the Spirit of God would help us understand and show us much of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray together. Dear Father, we do rejoice in your word. We rejoice in what you have given to us. And we pray today as we look at the section that we would discover more truth about Jesus and particularly how we can be acceptable before you. So give us help, we pray, by your spirit for the glory of Christ. Amen. One of the surprising new skills that I learned in 2020 was the ability to wash my hands. Um, if you had asked me at the start of 2020 which areas of my life were in need of a refurbishment, then I might have mentioned to you any of the following areas. Maybe my golf swing. My golf swing certainly needs attention, both for the safety of those around me and also the total numbers on my scorecard. So I could have mentioned that. I definitely love more parenting skills. I would love more husband skills. You can ask my kids if I do need more dad skills or whatever. I need more leadership skills, more pastoral skills. The end, the list is pretty long, isn't it, really? There are many areas of my life where I know that I fall short of what is possible. However, I did think there was certainly one area where, where I thought I had mastered it, and that was washing my hands. And then came the pandemic, and very soon we were being shown what to do, weren't we? We had all sorts of videos and diagrams presented to us with the right techniques of how to wash your hands, and indeed, the right length of time of how long you should wash your hands for. And people even shared songs. Do you remember that? Songs that we could sing uh, when we were at the sink. Uh, whether you could sing or not, it didn't matter. Any song that lasted about 20 seconds would enable you to wash your hands very, very well. I think it's pretty obvious that hand washing has become a big deal around the world in the last 14 months. Now, in the section of the Bible that we've got open before us today, you will see that we are presented with a major confrontation about washing your hands. I don't know if you've had a confrontation lately about hand washing, but way back in Mark chapter 7, we are presented with a major, significant, almost fight about the whole issue of washing your hands. And what I want to show us this morning is what is really going on, okay? What is happening here, and why is it relevant to every single one of us in the 21st century? So if you've got your Bibles open, let's have a look together. Verse 1, uh, we're told that the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law had come from Jerusalem. So this is a big deal, isn't it? They've, they've come all the way from Jerusalem to see Jesus. And they gather around him, not because they're his mates or his friends, but because they want to catch him out. Verse 2, some of um, them, they saw his disciples, the disciples of Jesus, eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And then in verses 3 and 4, we're given the background information to explain why these religious leaders are so annoyed. So verse 3, the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they gave their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Now, let me make one thing crystal clear as we begin to think about this section of the Bible. This is not a discussion about the importance of hygiene. This is a discussion about the importance of holiness. Okay, this is not hygiene. This is about holiness. If this was about hygiene, then the religious leaders would have a very strong argument. It is a no-brainer, isn't it, if it's about hygiene? If it's about hygiene, then how disgusting of Jesus' disciples to pick up their food with hands covered in dirt. But it's not the issue. It's not about hygiene. It's about holiness. It's not about dirt. It's about defilement. It's about being spiritually uncovered 
clean or spiritually clean. It's about being spiritually pure. It's about making sure that spiritual pollution from any wrongdoing is removed so that we can be presentable before God. Now, in Jesus' day, there was a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees, and they had developed a very elaborate system of regulations and rituals that were designed to keep them pure and were designed to keep them acceptable to God. Now, these were not actually teachings you would find in the Old Testament. Uh, These were additional rules and regulations and rituals that they had invented and they had added over the century to what God's Word had said. And to their astonishment, indeed to their amazement, they look at Jesus' disciples and they see that Jesus' disciples are not following what they prescribe. How dare they? And so what they do is they confront Jesus with a question full of accusation. And if you listen to these words, you can, I think, hear the venom the venom in their voices. This is the question they ask Jesus. Why don't your disciples, not just these disciples, but why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? And I love Jesus' response because it is both devastating and delightful. He says two things, and we're going to work through. He says, first, that religious people can be very far away from God. Uh, That is verses 6 to 13. And then secondly, he says, religious people can be very spiritually unclean. Let's work this through. First, he says that religious people can be far away from God. Listen to this, verse 6. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. This is a devastating blow for the religious leaders accusing Jesus. If you imagine the scene, they have their guns set on Jesus Christ. They've witnessed the behavior of Jesus' disciples. They've now got their guns set on the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus reveals the truth about their relationship with God. And in short, they don't have one. Or at least they don't have a genuine one. Jesus says, you are hypocrites. Now, the word hypocrite in the original language, in the Greek language that this part of the Bible was written in, literally means an actor. That's what you were. A a hypocrite was an actor. And in the ancient world, the actors didn't wear makeup and all that sort of stuff. In the ancient world, what did actors wear? They put on a mask. So the mask presented something that was different from their true identity. The mask allowed them to play the part. They were hypocrites. They were actors. But the mask, well, that was not the true identity beneath. According to Jesus, that's what these Pharisees are. Literally, the word Pharisee means separated one. So they were, they were trying to separate themselves from everybody else because they think they were very, very pure. But their religious life, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, is an act. Their daily life is consumed by, by the diligent keeping of multiple religious rules. And I guess many people, if we saw them, and many people of the day, would have concluded that if you were to look for a person who had a very strong relationship with God, it must be the Pharisees. Look at all the rules. Look at all how diligent they are. They must be very strong with God. But Jesus penetrates beneath the surface to the shocking truth, and he says, you are religious hypocrites. You are actors who beneath the surface are far from God. Yes, you keep lots of rules, and yes, you you say all the right things, but under the spiritual x-ray of Jesus Christ, he works out that their hearts are thousands of miles from God. How devastating is that for these people? How devastating is that maybe for religious people today? According to the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to verse 7. He says, your worship is in vain. Now, let that sink in. Despite all their activity, despite all their rules, despite all the regulations, despite everything that they are saying, Jesus says, your worship of God is in vain. That means it's empty. That means it's meaningless. It's pointless. What you are doing is utterly a waste of time. How sobering and sad 
but how significant that is. Now, one of the big reasons this happened to the Pharisees is because they moved away from the teachings of God's word and focused instead on human traditions. I was reminded this week that the Old Testament never demanded the elaborate ritual washing that the Pharisees did. The Old Testament had precise washing regulations for the priests, but that was not extended to the general people. But that didn't seem to be good enough for the Pharisees. So what they decided to do over the generations is that they decided to add to their own commandments. And what this resulted in was a neglect of what God had actually said in the Bible. And isn't that often the way? Bible mathematics. Let me give you a little Bible mathematics. When you add anything to the Bible, you subtract things from the Bible. That's how Bible mathematics works. When you add things to the Bible, you end up subtracting things from God's word. Human tradition easily replaces God's word. And the result is that religious rituals and religious rules replace divine relationship and divine revelation at the center of Christianity. Or in the words of verse 13, Jesus gives the example, doesn't he, of this Corban, of this devotion to God, and the the Pharisees had added to what God's word had said. But what does Jesus conclude, verse 13? You nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. It means that we need to keep the Bible center stage in the life of our churches. We cannot allow the slow creeping over months and years and decades where other traditions, other voices are added to the Bible. It can sometimes start with a a very good intention, but then over years and generations, what happens is the Bible words are obscured. We've got to ensure that when we teach our children, the next generation, the truths of the Bible, we can't just teach them from over here. We must actually pick up our Bibles and we must show them in the scriptures why we believe what we believe. Because if we don't show them from the scriptures why we believe what we believe, they will not be believing that stuff in about 50 years. We've got to keep on going back to the Bible. This is what happened in the European Reformation in the 16th century. What had happened over hundreds of years in Europe is that the Roman Catholic Church had added tradition after tradition to the clear teachings of the Bible and had created essentially a different religion. They had created a religion which was all about doing your best, meriting God's salvation, and if you didn't die at the right level, you went to purgatory, and then you were punished for a little bit of time, and then eventually you might have arrived in heaven with a perfect people. That is not what the Bible says. But what had to happen in the European Reformation in the 16th century is they went back to the scriptures. They went back to the Bible. They blew the dust off the traditions. One of the the phrases that was really popular, if you want a little bit of a Latin phrase to write down and impress your friends over lunch, uh, was, was the phrase ad fontes. Ad fontes meant literally back to the sources. Let's go back. Let's not just rely on books that were written about the Bible or teachers and traditions, but let's go back, open God's Word, and see what it says. And do you know what they discovered? They discovered the wonderful truth of God's grace, that it was about Jesus and his finished full forgiveness, and it, it allowed the people of the land to read the Scriptures. Do you know that in the 16th century, before the Reformation in England, you couldn't hear the Bible read in English? It was all in Latin. The people had no idea what was going on. It was all superstitious nonsense to them. And then when they tried to get the Bible in every pulpit in this land, in English, there was massive pushback because it was a threat to the religious teachers. We've got to go back to the sources. We've got to go back to the wonderful truth of what is written in God's Word. And we mustn't mistake dutiful religion with delightful relationship with Jesus Christ. Just because someone comes to church doesn't make them a Christian. You know that, don't you? Just because you go to McDonald's, it doesn't make you a hamburger. When you come to church, you come, and if you have faith in the Lord Jesus, you're part of the family, and you worship God. Do not mistake religious rules for a true relationship with Christ. So let me ask you the question, where is your heart today? Are you living for Christ? Are you sitting in this building? Are you watching at home? And maybe you are convicted that you are at the moment religious, but you have no relationship with Jesus. If that's you, give your heart to Christ. Don't live with a lie. Don't be the actor, but give your heart 
to Christ. That's the first thing. Second, Jesus says that religious people can be spiritually unclean. Look at verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Now, you might think, why does Jesus say this? What's, what's the point? Well, it seems that these Pharisees thought that the big problem facing their spiritual purity was outside themselves. Really interesting when you ponder it, isn't it? Because if I put it like this, I think the Pharisees thought the big problem wasn't them. The big problem was other people. <laughs> so the Pharisees considered themselves to be pretty good people, law keepers who left to themselves would be perfectly acceptable to hang out with God. But what was the problem? The problem was that they mixed. They mixed with other people. And those other people were not very nice, and therefore when they mixed with other people, the, the spiritual pollution of the other people must have been transferred to them. And therefore they had all these outward rituals to get rid of the pollution because it wasn't coming from them, was it? It was coming from the other people that they met in the marketplace and beyond. It's a bit like when you drive your car. I've had this experience, you're in the car, and there's somebody up front, and their exhaust is just like blazing out all sorts of pollution, and you can smell it, and you can taste it, and you're trying not to peep your horn and wave your fist like that. <laughs> but what happens, the pollution from the car in front just comes into you, doesn't it? And you are affected by what somebody else is doing. Well, the Pharisees thought other people uh, did this to them. And as a response, they made sure that they were richly washed themselves as often as possible. But Jesus looks him in the eye and he confronts that view and basically says that is nonsense. Now, listen carefully to what he says in verse 18. It's a lovely little opener, isn't it? Are you so dull? <laughs> Do you ever feel like that? Are you so dull? <laughs> Don't you see that nothing enters a person from the outside and defiles them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. I think you can work out what he's talking about. He then went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And just see which ones you're guilty of as I read through this list. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Jesus puts them all on the same level, so don't try and, try and change the levels. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Now, please do not miss how significant this is from Jesus Christ. This is game-changer teaching. He is saying that every single human being is naturally defiled before God. That is, without the help of Jesus Christ, we are all of us spiritually polluted. And that is in complete contradiction to the teaching of the Pharisees. They thought they were okay. They might need washing because other people were not okay and they were in contact with them, but they were okay. And Jesus says, no, religious or not, all of us have hearts that pump out sin. And what happens then is that sin leaves a stain. Now, many people in our generation don't believe what Jesus says on that point. I'm sure you've met friends and family. Maybe you struggle uh, even today, who don't believe what Jesus says on this point. Many of our friends and family will deny the words of Jesus, and instead they will insist that we are all naturally morally okay. We're not that bad, really. We're not like, like murderers, but we're not, we're not that bad. And the question I've got for us this morning is, well, who do we believe? Will I believe what Jesus says, or will I believe what people around me say? Let me encourage you, do not deny your sin. Believe what Jesus says about it. See its reality, see its resulting stain, and then, and then you will hear the wonderful news of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have been watching the football over the last few days? Did many of you watch the most boring match in the universe over the last few days? Uh, Scotland versus England. We kept our children up a bit later to watch it. It was so depressing. I think if I was the referee, I would have started to give people yellow cards, the next person who passed back to the goalkeeper. I think that's the way they should have worked. Let me take you back to, to a different game in 1966, which is hard for me to say because I'm Scottish, but it was probably the, the last real major triumph of England on the pitch. Let's look back to 1966 when they won the World Cup. Hooray, terrific. Then if you know that when Bobby Moore, the England captain, was picking up the trophy, he had to pick it up from Her Majesty the Queen. 
And Her Majesty the Queen, um, as she always would be, would be dressed uh, in pristine condition, and she was wearing uh, white gloves that were spotless. Now, as Bobby Moore uh, walked up to collect the trophy, what did he realize about himself? He'd just been playing a game of football for a long, long time on a muddy pitch. And he looked up at Her Majesty the Queen, who was holding the trophy, and he looked down at his hands that were covered in mud. And he knew that within minutes, he was about to take that trophy and shake her hand. <sighs> What's he going to do? Well, one thing you could do is you could probably just deny it, couldn't you? It's all right. <laughs> but he's going to be found out, isn't he, when he gets closer to Her Majesty the Queen. Well, he didn't deny it. Do you know what he did? All the way up, he starts doing this. He starts rubbing his hands, rubbing his hands, to see if he himself can clean himself up. It's the only way he can think about it, to try and clean himself up so that he is presentable and acceptable in the presence of Her Majesty. What would you have done if the camera was on Bobby Moore and the camera was on Her Majesty the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, and imagine she saw him coming up with these hands that were dirty and unclean, and suppose the camera zoomed into Her Majesty, and the next thing you knew, the Queen of England leapt over the barrier pulled out her marigold rubber gloves that were yellow, picked up a bucket of water with soapy water in it, and picked up a sponge, and came down the steps and said, Bobby, stop. I'm going to clean you up. Nah. Doesn't happen, does it? Has there ever been a story in the history where such a royal person would have lowered themselves to clean up people that are unacceptable to be in their presence. The Queen of England will never do that. But there is a King of Kings who has. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who tells the story, the one who does tell about the stain of sin and tells us not to deny it, the one that we are naturally, spiritually polluted to be in his presence, he came down. He left the glory of heaven. The one who tells the story went to the cross. And why did he go to the cross? Because this is the way that we are to be cleaned up. Our natural instinct as human beings is either to deny our sin or to try and come up with ways that we can clean ourselves up. But the Bible story is much more wonderful because it says that Jesus came down into the world to clean us up. And he does it by dying on the cross. And his blood shed on the cross is then applied to our souls by faith, and this fully, utterly cleans up our spiritual pollution. And you know something? Jesus does something even more. Because what's the problem? The heart is the problem. We have a heart that is selfish, a heart that is pumping out all sorts of selfish desires and all sorts of wickedness. And what the Lord Jesus Christ does, if you get this, he comes and he cleans us up perfectly, and then he gives us his Holy Spirit, he starts doing some open heart surgery on us. So the Holy Spirit starts to move in and starts to change the desires, so the heart starts pumping out other stuff. Amazing, isn't it? We have been told, let me finish like this, we've been told over the last 40 months that hand washing is very important. It is a vital way we have been told to limit the spread of a deadly virus and to save lives. Can I say something without dismissing the importance of good hygiene. Holiness is much more important than hygiene. This is about being in the presence of God, or not, forever. So let me ask you this question. Have you at some point in your life asked Jesus to clean up your stain? Do not deny it. <laughs> You know it's there. The guilty conscience that you feel from time to time that our culture likes to suppress and loves to say we are all victims and we are not responsible, the guilty conscience is there as a sign from God that yes, we are guilty and the stain is real. But Jesus has come to clean us up. And if you have, if you have asked him to clean you up, then please believe the words of scripture. You are clean. You are fully and utterly clean. God is for you. You are his beloved one. And because of that, there is nothing that you can do that will separate you from his presence forever. Praise the Lord. Let's pray.
So have a moment as you just want to ponder the truth of God's word and then we'll pray. Dear Father, we do rejoice this morning that we can hear these words and we do pray that you would help us to believe them, to not deny our sin, not to deny the stain, but to celebrate what Christ has done. Help us to be people of praise as we celebrate Jesus. Amen.